Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're getting going here on our uh, monthly Ask Mayfield Anything. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, as people are logging in, I want to give folks just a half a second to, to get going. But uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion today. We've been having great discussions around this already. Uh, and so I'm really excited to have, have this group of folks here to talk with me today. Uh, as we're going along, just if you haven't participated in our events before, these are meant to be very interactive. Uh, so we encourage questions coming in from the audience. We've actually already received some questions sent in via email. So, um, excuse me, we'll be trying to get to as many as we possibly can. I anticipate a lot of them today, but so we'll do, do what we can. In order for us to, to help us with that, what I ask from you is to use the Q&A section of the um, Zoom meetings, uh, not the chat function. Chat functions, your questions will get lost. The Q&A makes it easier for us to, to find them, to keep track of them. So uh, please do that. And by all means, you know, send the questions in as they, as they come in. So let's get going because I know this is going to be a topic that we're going to want to spend as much time on as possible. So my name is Ryan Mayfield. For those of you who uh, haven't met me before, founder of Mayfield Renewables, and I'll be acting as your, your host and moderator here today. I have a great group of folks that are joining us to talk about UL 3741. And so Jason Fisher, uh, John DePap and Greg Ball. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, uh, and I didn't prepare any of these guys for this, so um, <laughs> It, I all three uh, sat on the standards technical panel. If I, hopefully, I got that acronym right. STP for UL thirty seven forty one, and so they all have bring in their own you know unique perspectives, um, and so that that's a big part of it. So I just want to acknowledge that they put they have been actively involved in this. They were part of different working groups, and so they all have a great perspective here. There are of course. Numerous other people that were involved in those um, meetings and those discussions and writing the the standard. So there's a lot of people that could have been uh, part of this. It's just one of those things. It gets to be a full room really quick. So um, thank you all for joining us today, um, and really appreciate uh, the insight that you all you all be bringing in as we go along. So I'll do my best to to make sure everybody's you know integrating, and I don't think anybody is, uh, has lack of things to say about the the different things we're going to talk about. So uh, thanks, guys, for, for joining us. Um, super quick about Mayfield Renewables. We are a technical consultancy. Uh, and so one of the things we do is, you know, doing a lot of the education, things like this, uh, working with EPCs, contractors, and uh, trying to help disseminate useful information across the industry. So uh, if there's anything that we can support you on, feel free to reach out uh, and happy to talk about that. Okay, I know I ran through that kind of quick, but uh, at the same time, I know we're all eager to talk about this. So today's topic is understanding and applying UL 3741. We have um, prepared a few slides here. Again, there are um, plenty of questions out there. And so um, I want to make sure that we're leaving time for that and encouraging people to talk, um, send those questions in uh, as we're going along. We want to kind of level set, if you will, this whole conversation or set the kind of the baseline. Uh, and this was something that we were just discussing. Um, but as we're talking about this, this topic of UL 3741, uh, it's, uh, it's important to understand kind of the, the parameters, the, the walls around this conversation. And the UL 3741 standard is really born out of, well, I'm not gonna say born out of, but is referenced in article 690.12, uh, specifically B2 in the National Electrical Code. And so we are concerned with and looking at the conductors that are within the array boundary. And so this is important that we are looking at this in, in the sense of we have an array, we have an array boundary, we still have rapid shutdown outside the array boundary, we still have to control those conductors outside the array boundary. All UL 3741 is doing is giving us uh, multiple paths for how to control the conductors, how to put the array in a safe space or a safe reduced shock hazard, I should say, um, 
for firefighters when they're when they have their interactions. Um, Jason, I don't know. Do you have anything that else you wanted to to say about that specifically? The one thing I'd say is you said that, um, and I know where you said it, uh, but you said that it controls conductors inside the array boundary. That has been the case uh, when the in the other option, the eighty volt, the eighty volt of allowance in V uh, uh, two two um, allows or or requires eighty volts on conductors and says nothing about equipment. Um, an interesting difference with B21, this 3741 option, is that actually the equipment, the voltage potential and the shock hazard that the equipment could um, pose to firefighters is part of the consideration. Okay, thanks for, and see, even five minutes ago, you were telling me to watch my language and, and what I was saying here, and um, I've already got it wrong. So, um, no, no, I appreciate that. And it's, you know, I think it's a, a function of however many years we've been dealing with this and talking about this in one specific way. And now all of a sudden we are, we're talking about it differently. So um, you can correct me all day long. It's quite all right. Um, so this is, yeah, this is the starting point for what we're what we're talking about uh, in terms of UL thirty seven forty one, um, and so moving into the standard itself, um, which, by the way, um, if you uh, this question has come up before, uh, if you would like, you can actually you get it have access. Everybody has access to all the UL standards actually, but thirty seven forty one specifically, you create an account at UL. Uh, you can actually do a free online viewer of the standard. So uh, go to UL3741. I think they call it their digital view uh, option, create an account, and you have you'll have access to all this as well. So the scope of 3741, uh, this this first part is pulled straight from 3741. And so it is providing a means for evaluation for PV hazard control components. And so what it's doing, what it's giving us is this scientific method, this way of repeatable uh, methodology to measure shock hazard to firefighters when they are um, interacting with an array, I think is the, the language that they uh, that the standard uses. Um, and then there's this uh, statement here that the standard is based on the uh, presupposition that the array was installed by qualified persons and to applicable codes and standards. Um, there is reference to 2017 and 2020 NEC, and then this other note about the exposure to DC current to firefighters. Um, since all of you were involved, um, you know, Greg, maybe you want to speak a little bit to kind of this the scope of the the document to begin with before we you know dive too far into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, like 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 you said here, I guess what I would add to that, I guess, is that what we're looking at is um, a, a, a few presuppositions in addition to uh, the array being installed by qualified persons and in accordance with code, there's there's some other assumptions. One is that there are a set of firefighter interactions that are expected to uh, that could occur um, that this standard addresses. It, it does not address just going um, hog wild with saws and chainsaws and cutting through stuff. The, the uh, firefighters are trained not to do that. This is more about incidental or inadvertent interactions with the array. So that's 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 a pretty important assumption right up front. And the reason for that is important is because with with any kind of electrical equipment, if you if you you know turn a flamethrower on it or start chopping through with an axe, there's a lot of things you can't expect anymore with respect to safety. So that that's that's part of it. There was a lot of discussion with the firefighters that are on the STP um, about what's needed for that. So that's that's part of it. Then there's there's an evaluation of the equipment that that basically that it, any equipment that's being used for um, protecting protection is is also um, compliant with UL 1741. Then you go through this entire safety analysis where you uh, look at a whole different number of scenarios of firefighter interactions and come up with different fault scenarios and and uh, not just faults, but more than one fault because you have to have more than one fault to get a circuit path for current to go through um, to go through a, a person. So uh, the safety analysis is a big part of it. And then there's this there's also a big testing part where you um, intentionally do specific types of damage to the array 
that reflect the interactions that that were that were listed together. So that's that's kind of like super high level. Sure. Yeah, and that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. And I was actually going to bring up the testing one because I, I believe John, you were on the um, the testing committee or the the subcommittee. I'm not sure how the what the exact language was, but around the testing protocols and things like that. And so you know, I'd love to hear kind of from you in terms of you know what that looked like, what the um, kind of who was involved in that aspect, and, and just how those I guess at a high level how those testing procedures were were put into place. Right. Yeah, the testing part was obviously a critical piece in the development of the standard um, because rather than just uh, imposing, uh, frankly, somewhat arbitrary voltage limit, the whole idea behind uh, the testing was to actually use uh, human body models, uh, use data that's been collected by the NFPA um, and, and other uh, organizations that have conducted research on fire, firefighter activities over the years and, you know, electrical shock hazards and apply that to the development of the standard and uh, come up with uh, test methodologies that will uh, utilize all that background information um, to actually measure uh, risk, uh, electrical shock hazard, and then apply that in a way that, um, you know, in a, in a data-driven manner. Uh, ultimately to define some, you know, accept, acceptable thresholds. Um, and uh, that, that's what the tables uh, that I think we're going to take a look at here in a moment spell out so that you can actually uh, assign a hazard level to um, different um, voltages and currents. Hey, Ryan, can I say um, one thing here at the top of this whole Absolutely, thing? Absolutely, of course. Um, it's, you know, whenever we talk about this, it's just really important. It's kind of obvious, but let's just remind ourselves, PV arrays are safe to touch, right? As long as they've been installed according to the National Electrical Code. That's the whole point of the National Electrical Code, right? And uh, just like any other electrical device, um, they could become, they could pose a hazard if the insulation and other barriers and other things that are protecting from contact to live parts get damaged. And that was where, like Greg had already mentioned this with the firefighter interactions, and um, I co-chaired co that task group with Matt Pace, and we had, uh, it was either nine or 10, depending on whether uh, we consider a volunteer firefighter or fire, a firefighter. Um, weighing in on all of these interactions. And we spent a ton of time identifying, well, what, what are these interactions so that we could develop these tests so that we could check for damage? Because the only way that, that anybody would be exposed to any sort of shock hazard in any of, again, in any of our electrical systems, I mean, look at where we put our outlets, you know, in our walls, is that the barriers and other insulation devices and stuff like this are somehow compromised, right, or, or damaged. And so the tests then would check for that damage. And then we'd get to that point where now we put in the firefighter you know, body model, then you check for the shock hazard, et cetera. But I don't wanna just skip immediately to that because we've had, and Greg also said it, which is that it's basically requires two faults to be able to get into contact with a live circuit and shock yourself, all right? And so we have to, the, the process that Greg alluded to is very detailed, very document heavy. Um, so that you can, uh, you know, uh, make sure that you've covered all these different cases to identify what are the situations where somebody could get shot, because you know, as we know, the bird on the wire doesn't get shot, right? And the system, the, you know, you, somebody touching something that has uh, properly listed and rated and installed per National Electrical Code barriers and insulation barriers, et cetera, won't get shot. So we have to really do that extra work. And that and that was the work that took you know, a long time to develop and a heck of a lot of work on the part of the uh, task group members in STP. Great, thanks for that. No, and it's, it's a great point that, you know, the the idea, we, we need to come into it with that, that uh, thought process or, you know, that reality that the PV systems are safe uh, and, you know, and it's the damage uh, that we need to be considering and, and the associated shock hazard. So speaking of those hazards, John brought this up. And so um, in the standard, uh, there are description, this table eight description of hazards, and there's a definition of hazard levels. And those hazard levels have 
a numerical value, zero through three, and then they have a amperage value that's associated with them. So this is going to get into, um, I think, the discussion around how the tests are performed uh, and the fact that we're actually using, you know, using Ohm's law, right? We're using uh, the fact that there's voltage, there's current, there's resistance. All three of those things are present, uh, and understanding how the three of those interact with each other uh, to provide a, a level of shock, I guess, or a shock hazard for um, for the individuals. So I know John, you said that you you had something you were you know wanted to talk about on this slide, especially around the the hazard level, hazard level one, I think. Um, and so folks can see, you know, we have these hazard levels and we have these amperage ranges, you know, milliamps from zero to 2.67, uh, you know, that's a hazard level zero. And then hazard level one, I think is kind of where we start jumping into this. And so, um, yeah, John, do you want to kind of give us your input on that one? Yeah, I was just going to mention that uh, as long as you can demonstrate that the hazard level is not higher than level one, then that, that's sort of that considered acceptable um uh, an acceptable hazard level which does not require uh any any further um sort of protective measures to be put in place it's okay in other words that the firefighter be exposed to hazard level one as long as um it, it does not exceed that and go to level two for example right and so we'll get into i think in a little bit uh we're going to talk about some like some of the system level uh, approaches here um, and so the hazard level zero and one um, are those that I don't know quite how to say it, um, but those are you know the lowest of the shock hazards. Um, as and this is not to say that you can't have uh, hazard levels that exceed one um, and not be thirty seven forty one compliant. There are you can definitely have. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, group here, uh, but you could have a hazard level three. Um, that has a you know greater than 100 milliamp um, potential and still have a 3741 listed system. I mean, it's it's about how you are reducing that risk. Am I capturing that correct? Yeah, that that's right. Um, there's a whole other section of the safety analysis that looks at probabilities of different types of faults that could occur with those interactions. And so, the lower the probability, the the if you have real, really low probability type uh, failure modes, then then you could have a higher level than one for this. Do Do any of you want to, I guess, expand or talk about that probability a little bit? I'm I'm kind of curious, and you know, how how is that defined, or how is that um, quantified for for the listing process? Well, there's there's some stuff in the in the in the tables, but um if if you, i don't know if you want to open the standard but the but there's there's a, a, a probability of a failure for a, a first fault and then a separate probability of a failure for a second fault which as we've said you got to have two to to have to create a shock hazard then there is in addition to that there's a calculation for the frequency of occurrence which is where you take the probabilities of of those failures and combine them together and so at the end of the day, if your frequency of occurrence is with the way the table show it's it's table seven, if it's there, there it can range from one to to six. And depending on uh, the frequency level and what your current hazard level is, it the outcome is either no action required or action may be required. Um, or action is required. And and by that, that means you have to take additional steps to improve the safety of the system. So for example, if you had a module that that's glass broke really easily and you had a high current outcome uh, above the 40 milliamps, and that was a likely probability, then you're gonna have to go back and do something different. You're gonna either have to use a uh, stronger glass on the module, or you're gonna have to use more electronics or something. You know, some, you can't just, you can't go away from that. But if it's if it's a super low probability fault that would cause that, then then that might not allow you to to not have to take an additional action. The safety analysis is pretty complex, and it's it's kind of hard to explain in a simplified way. But but that that's essentially it. We're we're talking about 
the probabilities of multiple failures, which most standards don't get into. You, normally the standard is like a single contingency, single point of failure. This is looking at multiple failures. So probabilities have to be incorporated. Yeah, and I'd, I'd point out, Brian, uh, for those of you who want to go get the free viewer or uh, purchase the standard, there is an annex, Annex F, that goes through some examples, right? So. Oh, I don't hear Ryan. Um, yeah, the Annex F is was a real eye opener for me. I was doing some research and uh, uh, writing on the topic and going through it and looking at that and understanding what those how it got put into place or into play. And they have some great examples, kind of yeah. these worst case scenarios, um, which when we get there, I would love to kind of talk about what those worst case scenarios mean uh, from from your all's view. Um, and, that, and I point out that the STP or, or members of the STP that worked in the task group worked on that Annex F, so okay. like a third party or anything. Okay. Um, and, and I do have the, the free viewer open up here on the other screen if, if that's helpful. If anybody wants to direct me to that, I can, I can pull that up and show that as well. Um, well, great. Uh, so there, so it's, I think that the thing that I wanted to drive home on that was, you know, there's this whole probability section um, in this table seven, this hazard reduction description, you know, what, as Greg was just saying, you know, if a certain scenario happens and you're at various hazard levels, what, what is it that has to happen? Okay. Um, so a little bit more on the, the way that I guess the, the methodology of this uh, got put into play. Uh, and so part of this for the, for the standard was, again, I mentioned, you know, we have, you know, all the, all three components of Ohm's law in play here and the resistance values for the firefighters that are interacting and that will have potential interaction with these systems was taken into account. Um, so I'm not sure quite honestly, which one of you would be best to kind of tackle this or, you know, who you want to, who wants to speak up first. Um, but there were, there's these different values and can you kind of um, talk us through this table, uh, talking about the resistance and um, of the firefighters uh, and kind of what those, those different thresholds look like. I, I can start. I sent, because I, I think I sent this, this slide in, but I'm sure Jason can elaborate, but yeah, basically UL worked with Sandia to come up with um, resistance tables and they're looking at a whole bunch of things. One is the, the current through the body with different paths. So as you can see in that table, there's hand-to-hand -hand resistance going from left hand to right hand, uh, hand to one knee, hand to one foot. Um, this doesn't show all of them. There's other ones like hand to hip. Um, yeah, a, a few others I don't have memorized, but we're looking at all these different ones because the different firefighter interactions that were defined about how the a firefighter could get themselves involved with the array um, results in these different these different paths. So, so there was a lot of testing done to get come up with these distances. And as you can see, it's a function of voltage. So the resistance drops as the voltage gets higher, which which that obviously has to be taken into account. We're also from that previous table. There was some notes there about how we are assuming adults because we're talking about firefighters. It's, so we're not we're not including the resistance of, of children, for example, which we lower. Um, and the, 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 the decision was to use adult female resistances because they're a little lower. So it's a, a worse case than, than male. So there's that. And then the assumption is that the firefighters are wearing their standard PPE, which are in good condition. So that's turnout gear, which are the coats, the gloves and boots. And so with that, you have the body resistances, the resistances associated with this PPE, and that's what allows you to do this math where some voltage that's, that's uh, occurring in the array after the damage is done um, applied to all these resistances at different voltages, and, and then you have a way of calculating the, the current threshold that comes out. Yeah, and I, I think the only thing I'd add, because it's just, I've heard it a bunch, which is PPE. You know, a lot of people in the electrical trades are used to thinking that PPE is electrical, you know, rated PPE. Um, this this STP and UL was not oblivious to that. They, there wasn't actually 
um, you know, data on firefighter PPE. So we spent a ton of time identifying appropriate PPE, typical PPE, finding the, you know, representational elements of that. And then you all did a bunch of testing. And, you know, we have things like wet gloves, not just not just leather gloves, you know, but wet leather gloves. And we even went so far as um, through a lot of discussion because there was questions about uh, different resistive qualities of water that might be used. And if you introduce foam concentrations into the water that's being used. And so it's you'll see references in there for, you know, foam concentrations and different you know resistance values for wet gloves that have been uh, exposed to that. So there was a lot of work done to quantify from an electrical safety standpoint, the value of this PPE. And so that's, that's I think, just a really important point to make um, because I, I hear that question come up a bunch. I'll just add one, one comment. Uh, maybe it's uh, self-explanatory, but this table stops at a thousand volts because that is the current limit for uh, rooftop PV systems. Um, it's pretty much the standard in the commercial world these days. Um, I think I'll, there's still a lot of residential systems out there that are that are lower voltage. Yeah, thanks for that that point. And so, yeah, since we are talking about, I mean, this is rooftop arrays. And so, yeah, that thousand volts would be a working limit uh, based on National Electrical Code, exactly. Um, so there was a, a comment, it's, uh, I think, I feel like we touched on it earlier, but it, this is as good a time as any to bring it up. And I feel like we saw it in a similar comment um, uh, even before the the webinar talk started. Um, and so I guess the, I, I'm trying to summarize it. It was a relatively long um, question, but the this idea that um, I guess, the sorry, trying to talk about firefighters interacting with uh, within the array boundary. And so I feel like the what the firefighter community as part of this 3741, what they were saying as their standard protocols, what firefighters are trained to do is to not go into an array field and start, you know, trying to ventilate through a module or trying to, um, I guess, hack through a module. Let's, I can't think of a more eloquent way of saying it, um, you know, in order to do their ventilation um, um activities. And so I think there's still this, I think maybe a little confusion or something, but the idea here is that the firefighters are not, that's just not what they're going to do. Uh, and they're not trained to go do that. And so I guess, I don't know, I feel like Jason, you and I have talked about this before. And so um, I mean, that's part of that presupposition, right, of the standard uh, yeah. and the working knowledge of those in, in the firefighter community that were part of this standard. And so this wasn't just a group of PV professionals, you know, huddling off in the corner. There was a lot of firefighters involved in this standard. Yeah. I mean, this is where, you know, through an ANSI recognized uh, a consensus standard development process, it requires stakeholders, right? And so unlike even some early work done on rapid shutdown requirements, you know, in this case, we actually had a, a broad group of stakeholders from the firefighting community weighing in on these options. And of course, that's what we want to have, not people who, uh, you know, have uh, just think you know, that they they know what's what's good for firefighters. Um, and so through that process, I certainly learned a lot because I'm not a firefighter. Um, and, uh, you know, it was it was uh, very much the consensus of the group that um, firefighters are like, you know, all other um, employees that um, there, they, uh, there's OSHA requirements for them. You know, there's the requirements around the PPE. Again, you know, this is firefighter PPE, not the electrical stuff, but that's why we we've selected it here. Um, they're required to have that. If the PPE gets damaged, they're required to exit uh, the you know the the operations, um, and because it's all about their safety. And part of that um, safety is training requirements for training. And while you know those of us who have been in PV for a while uh, know that it took some time for uh, firefighters and some really good effort by a lot of really good folks that were focused on training firefighters um, on uh, safety of performing firefighting operations around PV systems. You know, it's the consensus now that um, by everybody that that's just a requirement and that the training is pretty much universal. 
And it's a lot, it's a, just a lot like all other hazards that firefighters, firefighters have to deal with all kinds of hazards. I mean, you hear some crazy stories talking uh, to them. And um, so they're trained, you know, just like they're trained uh, how to identify other hazards. They're trained to consider that PV equipment could be hazardous to so stay away from it. We know that this is why the um, rooftop fire setbacks uh, have been, were initially um, uh, created and um, put in place was to provide them with access around PV um, air arrays so that they could perform their operations safely and not have to contact. So where uh, the group ended up is that there were there was a lot of discussion on this and a lot of work and we identified, I can't remember, I can count them here. I have the, I have the list I could actually read off here of the, uh, of the interactions. I'll just go ahead and do that. So stepping on, walking on PV equipment, crawling on PV equipment, falling onto, falling onto uh, with a tool you know, on their belt, falling onto with a tool in their hand. We have a representational tool that Greg can talk a lot about. I remember he I'm working on that a lot. Um, held hose line, spraying the array, ladder, ladder hooks, contacting the array with firefighter in contact with the ladder, because um, it could be an aluminum ladder, of course. Firefighter holds tools and contacts arrays. So these, all these different interactions are laid out and they're given um, uh, uh, through the methodology of you know, creating these hazard risk assessment scores. Uh, it's all laid out in this table nine that you can look up in the, in the standard. And as you can hear is that there's plenty of firefighter interactions there. It's just that those firefighter interactions are consistent with their training, which is that we expect them to be operating in the vicinity of PV arrays. We don't want uh, firefighters um, you know, to avoid doing firefighter operations that they need to do just because there's a presence of a PV array. And all of this was an effort to ensure that when stuff happens, which it always does, um, that these would be reasonable things that we should test the equipment for to ensure that firefighters aren't exposed to hazardous shock um, levels uh, during these operations. Um, and so again, that's that's how the whole process worked out. I could probably talk too long about that, but hopefully that gives some basis for for uh, answering your question. No, I, it does. And um, there was while you were saying that, kind of a clarification came in from from uh, whoever asked the question. Um, it's an anonymous attendee, so I can't give you credit or or anything. Um, but it was so the question was about working under tilted module where wires are exposed, not cutting through the module. And so I think what you were just saying there is, I mean, that the whole thing here is that the the firefighters are not going into the array and doing that. Yeah, what there's there's actually activities. It's it's really interesting, and this is where I encourage people to really look into it, and not just you know, whatever think about the standard in the chat rooms or something, just like anything else in the world. Um, is that there's actually different scoring based on the tilt of the array and and et cetera, because um, you know, and there's always the ability for uh, the manufacturer and the um, the NRTL that they're working with, et cetera, to consider other options. You know, there is a lot of talk around that, that this isn't like the restriction of you know, only these sort of conditions. But um, if there was something unique about a design or something like that, that, that would be addressed. But you, you'll you see in here that it has to do with, you know, height from things. There's there's considerations over heights and there's considerations over tilts. So some of that um, that that uh, that person is talking about is addressed. Great, thank you. Um, question came in, says, what about the O&M people on the roof who don't have firefighter PPE? Uh, I mean, this standard is all about firefighter protection. I mean, that's what this is about. So I, I um, you know, for those that are, if it's an O&M activity directly related to the PV array, they sure ought to have their proper PPE and their electrical PPE in that situation. Um, if it's, you know, an HVAC person or something, um, then, really the the setbacks from HVAC equipment, those kinds of things would um, should be there in place uh, for as far as protection equipment. So I'm not I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, this is not intended for O and M operations. This is all about firefighter operations. Yeah, there's there's always there's there's a lot of what ifs and what abouts out there, and that's the whole point to a standard, right? Is to actually get to a point where the key stakeholders all get agreement about the conditions of hazard. I mean, we can 
there's allowances in the National Electrical Code for bare, open, you know, uninsulated conductors um, well above a thousand volts inside of buildings in certain cases. I mean, there's just, there's lots of different situations where um, things are allowed because people have determined that, you know, like, like is in the spirit of the standard, um, that the what about scenario doesn't apply because we have these other controls in place, engineering controls, training controls, qualified, you know, access, there's all kinds of different stuff here. So um, that's, I, I just like to level set that there because I, I certainly have heard over the eight or more years that we've been talking about rapid shutdown, heard a lot of what abouts, but that doesn't, sure. that doesn't help move as long. There's yeah. a lot of what abouts about the, the equipment that people think is perfectly fine right now. Go ahead. All right. And I would just add that, that you know, O&M o &M requirements are, they, they existed before 3741. They exist after. It's a, it's, it's a different animal. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. I'm going to um, keep us moving al uh, along a little bit. I want to talk about some system level solutions. Um, so, uh, I don't think I actually called this out during the during the um, introductions, but so Greg is um, with Tesla as well, and so I wanted to talk some about some of these system level solutions, what some of these thirty seven forty one solutions are, um, and so we can talk about that, and, and I'll, I'll give Greg kind of the floor on this one, um, just to talk about kind of you know where did this one hundred sixty five volts come from, and kind of what what this what this solution looks like. Yeah, okay. So if you, you know, based on those those current tables and those resistance tables we were talking about in the previous slides, it just so happens that if you if you get up to the, the a voltage limit of about 165 volts, um, then with the firefighter PPE, you're you're below 40 milliamps. Even if even if uh, there's there's extensive damage, there's no protection. No, no, no enhanced uh, protection against the wires. So it's that 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 voltage results in less than 40 milliamps with with the firefighters wearing their gear. Um, and it also assumes uh, the worst case body path, which happens to be hand to hip. So that's a firefighter interaction where they've fallen onto the array and the, the hip is in contact with with an array and they've they've grabbed something else that's that's live at the other voltage end of the other pole of the voltage. So with, with that, you can essentially do kind of like a fast track through UL3741. You don't have to do a lot of additional testing. Um, what, and what that means is that you can use devices, whether it's um, you know, conventional optimizers or what, but what, what, we, what we do is this thing that we call a mid-circuit interrupter. It's basically just a, a smart switch that sits between X number of modules, depending on um, how many modules you can build up and still have 165 volts or less. And um, so, so you, you still have to go through the process. That's, that's really important. This is, not, this is not really equivalent to the 80 volt option in the NEC because you still have to do the UL1741 things. You have to make sure that all enclosures on the roof are uh, rated for water spray. Uh, Etc. You still have to do. You still have to go through the safety analysis and all that. But but it is an easier path. And um, so those conditions are important. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to like minimize that. And then at the end of the day, the thing. The other thing that's really important is that you have very specific instructions about what equipment you can use and how that equipment is installed and what combinations, et cetera, are okay. And that's where I think the standard did a pretty good job of saying for the reporting, what you have to do is have uh, very specific instructions that are um, friendly for installers, but also for HJs. So the HJs can look at this, this sheet, like this example we have here on, on the page there. Um, they can look at the sheet and just check the model numbers, the part numbers, make sure it's installed the way it says it should be, et cetera. And that gives, that that's what makes it a UL3741 system, as opposed to just something where someone says, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got no more than 165 volts here, we're good to go. There is still a very strict process for it. And what I would what I would just say, like, that's part of that sheet is, uh, we, we have three different listings, one for our solar roof product, which you could put 10 modules between MCIs, one for um, our uh, ZEP 
legacy ZEP uh, type installations, which use conventional modules, and one that we use that, that we allow for generic PV arrays, and that's that's the one that's shown there. And I you can't see the detail, but but the, the point is that with with uh, with the Tesla inverter, with the Tesla MCIs, and with specific um, conditions for the modules and mounting system, basically that they meet 61730 and 2703 and all that stuff. And they're using the right connectors, using the right initiators, you're using the right voltage threshold. You're installing it for other instructions. You're making it possible for the HJs to check that you've done it the way you've said you've done it. All of that has to happen. But if all of that happens, then you can use generic modules and generic mounting systems with, with the Tesla inverter and Tesla MCIs. So that, that's kind of the point of all that. So it becomes... So you're just saying it. So it's agnostic to the racking system. It's because of the hazard levels that are being met with with that. And it's exclusive yeah. exclusive of the racking methodology. Yeah, and it's it's specifically it's specifically dependent on the fact that you're installing the MCIs um, in an interval between modules that that you won't get above 165 volts in cold open circuit. Cold okay. weather open circuit. So that that's it. But yeah, but it's very it's very explicit about what you have to do to to meet that requirement. Okay. So a question came in: Do the MCIs require PV RSE listing as well? So PV yeah. rapid shutdown equipment yeah. listing. And so what what listing is that specifically? It's it's seventeen forty one. It is a part of seventeen forty one. Okay. And depending on the type of device you're using, you might have to use UL nine ninety one to to do a functional safety analysis on it so it's it yeah before we even touched 3741 we had to take that mci through a lot of paces so that's that's a good thing okay great so so we have this 165 volt um bit here on the next slide i'm going to kind of address it as well so i kind of want to just bring it up right now as part of our industry over the past since the 2017 code cycle, we've had this, this 80 volt threshold number, and that's still an option to meet the rapid shutdown. This section, uh, 69.12 B2, uh, it's B2.2 now, I believe, um, that, you, that you can, here I can, I think I can use this language, you can control the conductors within the array boundary so that they are no more, they are no more than 80 volts um, at any you know, two points. Um, and that's still a legitimate way of meeting this section of 690.12. Um, I, I, Jason, you're on the code making panel, so um, I, I don't want to like call things out too much, I guess. But um, so this 80 volt threshold has been there since again 2017. It's become this de facto 80 volts equals safe, right? Um, I think in a lot of people's minds, and I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong. I'm just saying that that's the way I think our industry thinks. And so now we have this testing methodology. And if you go through, and this is what um, Jason, you brought up earlier, the appendix F, there's a example, there's two examples, I believe, of methodologies and, and how um, testing the testing process can work in these worst case scenarios. Um, and it all kind of boils down to this 165 volt number, I think is more or less where, where we end up. Um, the standards, you know, saying under these worst case scenarios, that hand to hip, um, and that hazard threshold of one, which is 40 milliamps. Um, if you do all the math and you do the iterations, uh, 165 volts is kind of that maximum threshold. So I guess the question is, um, you know, 165 volts, is it the new 80 volts, I guess? I, I kind of say that a little bit tongue in cheek, um, but it's, to Greg's point, it's not like it's a rubber stamp, right? It's, you still have to go through and you still have to do the testing and things like that. So I guess I just wanted to point out or bring that to people's attention because that was a new one on for me as I was going through and, and really um, doing some um, review on the standard um, that there is that option, but it's not, again, it's just not a rubber stamp. Yeah, and I think that you said it, the 80 volts equals safe. Well, no, I mean, that's the, the actual general guarding requirement in the National Electrical Code is 50 volts. And, um, and then there's plenty of arguments around that it needs to be much less than that, to like 30 volts or whatever for pure, you know, true touch safety uh, for anybody. 
um, without any PPE. And, and UL's made this argument a lot, and they even talk about 15 volts uh, AC. Uh, and you'll see those various voltage numbers across the National Electrical Code for various things. So, you know, we, we all know that 80 volts was just a, a pragmatic number that was uh, initially developed when the inside the array requirements were, or were moved forward. Um, and yeah, the point about 3741 is that it's fair to say that it's, it's, there's no voltage limit other than, as John pointed out earlier, that um, the data that's used to, to, uh, to actually you know, uh, do the calculations does stop at 1,000 volts. But um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily that, that's a hard limit uh, in, in the analysis. So that's just talking about you know the conditions after rapid shutdown because again one of the assumptions here just like with the 80 volt requirement is that you're talking about a system that's been where rapid shutdown has been initiated. Great. Okay, I'm going to move us along a little bit. Um, I want to. Uh, there's two other system level solutions I want to talk about. And, um, one of which is um, these other 3741 um, potentials. And quite honestly, you know we had a lot of discussion about this. Um, you know, I'm showing the SolarEdge uh, P1101 uh, optimizer, um, kind of pulled out their um, their listing section of their spec sheet here, and so you see they've gone through and they've gotten a 3741 listing. So I'm I want to make sure that we're you know making people aware there's other options out there. Um, had a whole discussion about module level power electronics, um, and we're you know actually having two modules in what this listing has allowed. Um, Solar Edge, and I believe Enphase. I'm not. I've, I've, I'm getting conflicting information on the commercial inverter from Enphase, but and there's probably other manufacturers out there. So pardon me if I've omitted you. It wasn't on purpose, um, but the, it allows these manufacturers like Solar Edge to put two modules in series, which now all of a sudden we know exceeds the 80 volts of the one of the options in 690.12. Uh, but by having this 37, 3741 listing, uh, they're able to go through and just like Greg pointed out, uh, you know, through the testing, through compliance, they can show that the hazard level is stays at a value that does not put the firefighters at inherent risk. And my understanding on the solar edge system, other systems similar to this, that it is similar, like what Greg was saying, you know, racking independent. So it's not tied to a specific uh, overall uh, racking system or things like that. And so it, again, it's a, it's a tool, another tool in the tool belt, right? It's um, a way for 3741 to be met uh, in a different, different avenue. So I just want to make sure that, uh, again, I didn't have any um, folks specifically um, on this call that, you know, about that. And I just want to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible, I guess, uh, or as, you know, as complete as possible, I should say, uh, uh, in terms of, reporting, showing people what those options are. So I wanted to just bring that up, kind of bring that to the forefront uh, and let people uh, know about that. Okay. And then I also wanted to, I think one of the big ones, we had a similar conversation about a year ago um, around 3741. Um, and I think this is one of the areas. And so this is another option, another way. And so this is, I'm going to let John kind of speak to this um, here as we're you know, as we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, but another solution uh, of using, in this case, a specific racking system with specific components in order to meet the 3741 requirement. So John, you wanna kind of talk us through this solution? Sure. So Panel Claw has a, a commercial flat roof ballasted mounting solution called Claw FR. Um, it's actually been on the market for several years now. Um, and it, there, there are three different uh, product configurations. There's a 10 degree tilt, a five degree tilt, and a dual tilt configuration. And if anyone's wondering why would you bother or even attempt to list a mounting system to UL3741, um, the reason is that uh, UL3741 uh, provides an opportunity uh, to specify what's called the PV hazard control system. Um, and that is another way to satisfy the, uh, the rapid shutdown requirements in the NEC, um, which we've been discussing. And you know, when you think about firefighter interactions, um, how they move across the roof as they're uh, dealing with uh, a, a fire issue, obviously there's gonna, there are going to be some interactions with the structural components of that PV system. So 
the mounting system is obviously an important part of that structure. It is the structure um, that's securing all the modules to the roof. So many of the interactions that Jason listed off are going to be, uh, they're going to directly involve the PV system or maybe indirectly. Uh, for example, if the firefighter um, is, is walking on or falls on a module, possibly with a firefighting tool. Um, so some, those are some of the scenarios where the, the mounting system is directly involved in this hazard assessment. And so the, the mounting uh, system, in this case, CLAWFAR, uh, the modules, and also the inverters are involved here as well. Um, it, it's really a, it's a system uh, listing to UL 3741, um, not just a, a, an individual component, but all the, all the major components in, in the PV system are involved in this listing. And that's why if you look at the CLAW FAR UL 3741 listing, you'll see that there are specific inverters that are called out. They must be used or an inverter from that list must be used in order for uh, the system that you build to be uh, compliant with the 3741 listing uh, of the CLAW FAR product. Um, and so beyond the components, the major components, uh, there are uh, accessories, uh, in particular wire management accessories that are also a part of the, the listed solution. Um, and there may be questions uh, around uh, what are the details of those accessory components. We do provide some guidance in a, an installation addendum. There's a UL3741 installation addendum for the Qualifier product that's available on the, on the website. Um, and I suspect that we will be providing further details about some of those accessories uh, to make it explicit and obvious for installers that want to utilize those components and be confident that they can demonstrate compliance to the standard. Awesome. Yeah. And so I think one of the things, you know, we were having internal conversations uh, and so I, I'll just kind of bring it up, but, you know, one of the questions or one of the things that is, you know, how is this different than other systems that were, you know, installed pre UL 3741? And I think the answer there is, you know, we now have a testing methodology. We have a way of evaluating these systems uh, to a specific standard, you know, we did not have that before, uh, but now we do. And so they may look very similar, but we, we have, um, explicit ways of, of doing that testing and doing and evaluating that. Um, so I guess that would be, um, something that I would just want to add on to that. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I would point out that there are some new constraints that are imposed by the standard. Uh, for example, if you happen to have any strings in the system that are spanning between subarrays, which are more than two feet apart, uh, there are some extra uh, safety measures that must be implemented. So there's other safety measures, I'm sorry, that must be implemented for um, because of the hazard level, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. in particular, you know, if you had a string wire that was uh, exposed um, that, that, that ran between array, adjacent array boundaries, Mm -hmm. uh, you would uh, you would need to actually insert an isolation device uh, in that in that in that string between the between those uh, two array boundaries. Okay, okay, and just a point of the question came in. I, I feel like I, I I do know the answer, but I'll throw it out there to you anyway, Jason. So thousand on this specific system, the limitation is thousand volts, which is equivalent to the the rooftop limitation. Is, is that correct? Well, I mean, I. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how to answer that question um, because, again, the the pass fail has to do with current. Um, so what they've done, and I don't know, and you know, any okay. details at all about the system, but they've just tested it to ensure that the firefighter isn't exposed to uh, two points of contact that are going to send current above forty milliamps through their body. And and you know, I mean, this this is very similar to systems that were built um, before thirty seven forty one. It's just that. This is a, a, a multiple module power uh, level power electronics, right? MM uh, LP, you know, as opposed to just MLP, just to make sure that everybody starts using the terms correctly. Right, and and to clarify, so the Clawfar system was tested uh, for up to thousand volt um, operation, um, and in the worst case 
uh, test scenarios, the hazard level is one. Um, without uh, any additional uh, safety measures to um, to reduce the uh, the voltage inside the array boundary. Okay, awesome. Uh, and, hey, Brian, let me just- Yeah, of course, of course. I just wanna make sure it's clear too, like when you're talking about the difference between these systems and systems pre-2017 or whatever, the, these tests aren't, they're, they're not like simple tests. They're, they're pretty violent. There's, there's, you know, sharp objects, there's, punching bags that weigh 300 pounds, roughly, uh, to simulate firefighters carrying heavy equipment, just landing right onto the sensitive spots. So, you know, there's the wire management involved is, is, is particular. The, the, the way the, the modules are set up is, is specific. It's, it's, it's not that, it's not that simple. Like you, you can do this, but it's not simple. Don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand what you have to go through to, to demonstrate these. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point, Greg. And I want to point out, for example, um, you know, you may focus on the, the the metallic components, and you might think, well, and 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 the modules themselves. I think everyone knows that modules are are quite rugged. Um, but in a inside the array boundary, you know, you think about a firefighter walking down a walkway, and you can see there's uh, in this graphic here, there's a walkway shown, and you can see the wires routed beneath the module. There are also wires that are routing right across that walkway, and they are contained in those wire management channels, which are uh, an available accessory with the claw bar system. Those were an integral part of the testing process. They had to withstand uh, these impacts from firefighting tools uh, to, to, to demonstrate compliance with the standard. Um, so that, that, is, that, that was part of the, um, the evaluation. And I think that's, you know, it's, a, it's an important piece um, that, that guarantees firefighter safety. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pull this one up uh, and just kind of some of these key takeaways. And actually, one of the things we hadn't even really talked about, um, you know, this, again, this was a, a scientific approach to, to this. The, um, this is a first edition. Uh, feedback and discussion is always welcome to improve this standard. Um, my understanding is, you know, it's, well, I don't know how active it is, but um, in terms of revisions, things like that, but there's there's no way to make it better if we don't get input uh, and productive feedback and discussion around this. And so this is, you know, one of the reasons why I, I'm happy to help facilitate something like this, because I, I feel like this might help do exactly some of that. Um, so yeah, yeah, so there, there are revisions in process. There's direct okay. work being done, and and UL doesn't unlike the NFPA 70. It's not like according to a rigorous timeline, but it's it's absolutely open uh, for revisions. And there's there is work being done. Awesome. Um, so uh, we're going to close here. I'm going to get to a few more questions here. So just you know, if you're um, looking for some more support, things like that, here's a, a few ways that you can get a hold of us. We're actually going to be at NABCEP next week. If any of you are there, love to say hello, talk to you, um, and then we have a variety of other ways of of supporting folks. So I'm going to um, leave this here for a second. I'm going to go look at a couple of questions. I know we're getting really close to the top of the hour, but there's a few that I, I did really want to get to. Hopefully um, folks can stick around for just another minute. Um, so Grant asked the question about more guidance around the subarray compliance issue, saying, for example, how many subarrays can you have with a two-foot gaps and DC isolation devices between them? Uh, and I think I'll kind of take a little bit of a stab at that. And, you know, if you have two feet or less of a gap between any grouping of modules, and that is still within the array boundary because you would not have any section of that array that is more than one foot from the the array, the, the other array, I guess you could say, or the other section. So if you have, if you're able to keep those for, you know, during your design, the, those gap, gaps to two feet or less, then it's all one array boundary. So there's really no, I would say there's no limitation on that. Um, and if you are if you have to have pathways, things like that, where you're required to have a firefighter pathway four feet, uh, then all of a sudden there's no way to have but multiple arrays, multiple array boundaries. And so anything that leaves that array boundary is going to be subject to outside the array boundary, 30 volts within 30 seconds. And that's just going to be a requirement that is going to be part of, of uh, NEC. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add on to that or... 
Yeah, no, that's 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 right. Um, you know, it's it all has to do with the boundary and how that's defined. And and again, for those who don't know it, you there is a definition for the array, and you know, you have to just like any other definition or requirement in the NEC, you have to apply it to your specific equipment. But it's not like there's no guidance. Right. Um, there was another question here. I kind of and it's. Um, Mark, I think we got your question. Um, I think John answered talking about the racking system, kind of what the characteristics of the racking system need to look like. So um, hopefully that got that one answered. Um, and then there's there's one last question. Um, it's kind of a big one, so um, hopefully we can keep it to a relatively brief answer. But um, I, I think this opens up a little bit for, you know, um, getting back to kind of what we were doing before, I guess, um, in the example that John, you showed us, you know, the, or the um, inverters up on the roof. Um, and so I guess the, you know, people are constantly asking about, you know, that being the solution and we kind of got away from that. I don't know if this group has any like input on those power electronics inverters going back up on the roof. Um, if there's any like detriment, uh, if we're opening ourselves up to any sort of like detrimental aspects in that sense. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think a lot of solutions that have been deployed use power electronics up on roofs, right? And it's just we're maybe using fewer of them. And I think it's often pointed out that that generally means fewer connectors. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things for manufacturers, designers, et cetera, is that, uh, and I certainly appreciate this as, a, as an old fart who used to be an installer, is that... Um, we might have some options with regards to where the power electronics get located, which can certainly mean that the, you know, because power electronics tend to fail, uh, that they can be uh, inspected and, you know, serviced and stuff um, easier. And some might argue safer because rooftop work is not necessarily the safest type of work. So, yeah, again, I just say these are MM LPEs, right? Or in many cases, I mean, there's not that much difference. Um, it, it has to do with the quantity and, and location in many, in most cases. Great. Cool. Um, I guess for the group, you know, we are past the hour. So I want to, you know, if anybody has any last comments, I see that there are a number of questions that we weren't able to get to. We probably have to spend at least another hour uh, going through all those. So I apologize if I wasn't able to get to yours. Um, you know, our contact information is here. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, and I will try and there's some specific questions I think that were directed to to Jason and Greg and um, and a couple to John, I think. So I'll make sure that they see those. Um, but happy, I'm happy to, you know, be that point if people have additional questions and want to talk. So um, I don't know if anybody on the panel, you have any like last last words you'd like to to say for the those attending? Yeah, thanks for the interest and thanks for the opportunity to discuss. It's always good to talk about these things and uh, this is an important topic. So thanks for organizing it, Ryan. Yeah, I'd say the same thing, Ryan. Thanks a lot. I know there's a lot of confusion about this standard and I think it's great to be able to talk about the different examples. Totally agree and really happy to see that there were well over a hundred uh, attendees. So fantastic. Yes, well yes, done. thank you all. Thank you all for you know on the panel for participating. Thank you all for attending, uh, giving up your your lunchtime hour with us. So um, again, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm happy to continue the conversation. So feel free to reach out.